from a very young age, I have loved science. <laughs> um, I remember being a little toddler and running around the house and collecting all sorts of things to look at under my toy microscope. And I told just about anyone who would listen that I was going to be a doctor of some sort. Around that time, I also developed a fascination with the morbid and the macabre. <laughs> so it was only a matter of time before freshman year when I was first introduced to true crime. So as I studied case after case, there was one recurring theme that I found across every single one and that was post-mortem injustice. So police officers almost never took a case seriously, or they would take too long to take action, or they would ignore glaringly obvious pieces of evidence. And so one case that really deeply infuriated me was that of Sophia Silva. She was a 16-year-old girl, and one day she went home to do her homework. She was with her sister home alone, and it was a really nice day outside. So she decided to go do her homework outside. So she grabbed a grape soda for homework and went and sat on the porch. And that was the last time she was seen alive. The police didn't take her case seriously. They immediately thought that she had just run away, even though there had been no prior evidence that she was unhappy or would want to do that. And then a few days later, they found her body in a river. And that's when they realized that she was murdered. So they immediately suspected one of her neighbors. His name was Carl Michael Roosh. And this man had a prior criminal record. He had done a lot of like weird things. He was also strangely friendly with the children of the neighborhood and had been seen talking to Sophia. So people investigated him. One thing about Sophia is that she had purple nail polish on when she died. And when they looked in his trunk, they found rope and purple fibers. So they thought, this is our guy. And so they took him to prison and the forensics team was so convinced that it was him, even though the evidence was completely circumstantial. So they analyzed a little purple pigment and realized it was in fact her nail polish. While in prison though, he said that he was innocent, but everyone was like, no, this is the guy. Until a few days later, two more murders of a similar manner were committed. And so they reanalyzed the evidence and found that it actually wasn't her nail polish. But the forensics analysts were so convinced of his guilt that their bias ended up blinding them into finding false evidence. So it ended up being years before they caught the actual killer. So this case was a major turning point for me and made me consider a career in forensics because I want to do all that I can to ensure that justice is actually served. But then I put it into practice. And for the duration of first semester, I dove deep into forensic pathology. So pathology is where um, the doctor, the pathologists, they analyze tissue samples to determine various, I guess, defects within the sample. And there's a distinction. Um, forensic pathology is a subset of pathology in which the doctor performs an autopsy where they dissect a person who has suddenly or unexpectedly died to determine the cause of death. And as it turns out, this was really cool to me in theory, but it is actually incredibly taxing when put into practice. And so at the turn of the semester, I realized that I couldn't pursue this for the rest of the year, much less my life. So I decided to change my capstone topic since first semester, I knew that I wanted to focus on justice initially through science. And I knew that I still wanted justice to be at the heart of my project. So I redirected my focus to pursuing it through law. And it's something that I had always wondered about, but I never really put much thought into it. I had been so certain all my life that medicine is what I was called to do. So I had never really put much thought into it. And I also had like, the weirdest like deterrence from law, it got to the point where I went to an appointment and I'm sitting there waiting to be picked up and the receptionist and I get to talking and she's like, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking either medicine or law. And she looks at me, she goes, don't become a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, 
my ex-husband was a lawyer. I do not want to have that. I was like, oh, my mom's here, gotta go. <laughs> but a few months ago, I was like, you know what? I might as well see for myself. So I set out this semester to learn all that I could about criminal law. Isaiah 1 says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. And in this project, I hoped to follow this call. So the primary skill that I learned in my capstone was adaptability. I was absolutely positive that forensic pathology was the right path for me. It was something I had begun planning for two years ago. It was during one of our lockdown walks. I was just walking and I was like, I think forensic pathology is the one. So I had been planning this for a really long time and I was actually genuinely really excited to pursue it as my senior project. However, I soon, I soon realized that it was not the right path for me. My first experience was attending a webinar with Hannah on the forensics of blood spatters. And at this point, I was still very interested in the field. And it was actually really cool to learn about. And though it ended up not being relevant to the pathological side of forensics, I still found it really, really fascinating. And then a few months later, I was able to interview a forensic pathologist. <laughs> and things changed. <laughs> I asked him about his job and he referred to it as the unending parade of human misery. Because <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> this whole career centers around death and the dead. The interview lasted an hour and a half and it led me to realize that this job is nothing like what it seems. It is completely and utterly depressing. <laughs> and if you don't have the proper personality for it, it'll just take a big toll on you. And I thought I did have the right personality for it. And as it turns out, no. <laughs> so at the start of the second semester, we talked about the remainder of our projects, and I realized that I absolutely could not continue pursuing forensic pathology. I couldn't even imagine having another interview or experience about this sort of topic. And so I wrestled for a while with the prospect of switching topics as this was just such a heavy thing to dive into. And I'm someone who really likes structure and stability. So I was actually really uncomfortable with the idea of essentially scrapping everything I'd done already, throwing it out the window and starting from scratch. However, at the end of the day, I realized that I just wasn't prudent to devote yet another semester to something that I really didn't like. So I turned my attention to criminal law since I had always been curious about it. And it seemed like a pretty good match for my personality and it interested me, but I hadn't really looked into it before. So I decided that this semester that would be exactly what I did. I would learn more about the legal world. And though it was difficult to switch topics mid-year and I was completely lost and felt far behind for a very large chunk of the semester, I'm actually really glad I did it because I discovered that this is actually a really feasible career for me. So something that I learned about law is that it is actually really, really long and really, really tedious. <laughs> so as an experience, I went to watch a jury trial. This is a completely real picture, by the way. <laughs> as it was only the beginning stages of the trial, they were only just selecting their jury. I was there for like four and a half-ish hours and they still hadn't finished their jury selection when I'd left. I think in the media, we see a lot of, you know, fast paced, almost action packed scenes. You know, the attorney dramatically storms into the room, presents his case, and he sways the jury to his side and wins. And instead, I was greeted by a pretty dull scene. The prosecutor and the defense attorneys were already sitting there quietly chatting with each other. The jurors were slow moving and mostly just grumbled, trying to get out of jury duty. <laughs> if you remember in Guys and Dolls, when the crap shooters enter the mission, that was essentially like <laughs> <laughs> And this seriously shifted my perception of the legal system as I had always believed it to be the fast paced, dramatic scene we see on film. It was honestly like boring. <laughs> and I'm sure that the trial itself, you know, following jury selection was less so, but 
probably still not as dramatic as it would be in the movies. So I am glad that I had this exposure because it also helped me realize what jobs I wouldn't want, <laughs> prosecution or defense. <laughs> Seeing the prosecutor publicly speaking and improvising all this stuff on the spot to weed out the jurors, it's not something that I would want to be doing. And I also don't think I could be a defense attorney. Um, if I knew my client were guilty, I just couldn't represent them. I know like they all have the right, but I couldn't do it. If I'm just there and they're like, by the way, I do commit mass murder. Um, help me get out of this. <laughs> so after seeing this trial, I was able to check those two jobs off the list. <laughs> so I also did a research project as part of Capstone. For my research project, I looked into the psychology and the personality of the typical attorney. So after I wasn't able to click with forensic pathology, I wanted to make sure I was more compatible with law. So to do this, I looked into a study of the most common personality traits of attorneys, as well as comparing them to the Myers-Briggs personality types. And what I found was that lawyers tend to be skeptical, logical, efficient, and independent, as well as having low resilience and low sociability. <laughs> so, luckily <laughs> for me, this was pretty in line with my actual personality. <laughs> Secretly a lawyer. <laughs> Along with the psychological study, I looked into the Myers Briggs personalities. And what I found is that lawyers tend to fall within introversion, intuition, thinking, and judging, or the INTJ personality type. This was also great news for me because that's literally me. <laughs> I've taken the uh, Myers Briggs test a multitude of times, each time it's been the same, so I'm pretty confident in that. And so the introversion aspect roughly cor corresponds to the low sociability ratings that most attorneys have. In the second category, they take in their information primarily through their intuition rather than their senses. They are more logical, making decisions based on thought rather than feeling. And in the last category, they are organized rather than flexible and prefer structured spontaneity. So the research project was actually really insightful and opened my eyes. As I found that should I go into law, it actually would be a really good match for me. And so my capstone did not take me where I'd expected it would. I started a medicine and ended anywhere but. However, this project has taught me adaptability and not everything is going to work out according to plan. And I had to adapt to the realization that I was not pursuing the right thing. Also, I'm really relieved to have discovered this early that the path I wanted to take is not actually the right path for me. As of right now, there is a good chance of me going into law into the future because as it turns out, I actually really liked learning about it this semester. So in college, I'm gonna be studying great texts on either the pre-law or pre-med track. And after putting more consideration into it this semester, I very well may opt for pre-law. And I don't know for sure where it will take me, but I do know that for now and beyond, I want to con continue to pursue justice. Thank <laughs> you.